Good morning. Uh, the talent development I consider is the key responsibility of the leader. I am going to use my personal experience to share with you. And in 1976, I founded the ASA with 25,000 US dollars. I already uh, behave what I am talking about the new Wang Tao philosophy. The basic core value is create the value, balance of interest, and also sustainable development. Value is co-created co by all the stakeholders through an innovation approach and keep the balance, relative balance with all the stakeholders is a very important motivation to all stakeholders. But in this one, this, by this way can uh, keep the organization sustainable. Talking about value or the cost, I consider have a six aspect. Direct, indirect, tangible, intangible, and the present and the future. And as a leader, they should pay attention on the invisible cost and the value, means indirect, intangible, and the future. Normal people, they are not pay attention on the visible value, like current, direct, and the tangible cost or value. So that is the difference. I am looking for the total value or total cost consideration. When I start the company, the ASA corporate culture and the managing philosophy is quite different with the a mainstream in the industry. I consider human nature is good. And then a decentralized management philosophy. And we pay the, all the employee nation free. So for this, I think it to me is most effective way to develop the talent. And uh, in the 1992, fire is uh, faced a difficulty. I initiated the re engineering first time. We have three times re engineering. First time, after which 100 million US dollar war hit the night, we have a difficulty. So I, the major approach is we try to develop the CEO, we call Group Dragon, Qin Long Ji Hua, for 100 CEO in that time. And then I have a slogan called the 21 in 21. Today we have more than 100 CEO in the group. 21 in 21 means 21 published company by 21st century. It's easy to deliver this check because 100 years in 21st century in that time. And today we have more than 24 public companies in the group. And also I also announced that 20, uh, 2000 in 2000 means 2000 NT dollar E in year 2000. This two, NT dollar 2000 E is about 700 million in that time. And today, the overall group is reached to more than 35 billion US dollar with the all uh, ASA, BenQ, with Kingstar, with Strong, and the AU all together. And I also have a Call a slogan called the global brand name because I decision to have a global brand from Taiwan, but apply a local touch, local management. That means again it is the 
decentralized management philosophy. So today, two-thirds of Asian employee is non Taiwanese work all over the world, and they make most of the decision for the company. Okay. And uh, I believe Acer is one of the most uh, global ranked company. I am not, I believe that the, the globalized approach, I think globalized is the right way. And uh, I, in that time, I also make announcement. I am going to retire at 60 years old, quite early in, in Taiwan uh, uh, society. And, but this is important to encourage everyone to have a hope in the future. So after I retired almost 20 years, I am retired from the ASA, but I am not retired from the society. I still keep busy. <laughs> and uh, I don't have any, have any position to fulfill corporate social responsibility, CSR. But I have a PSR, personal social responsibility. <laughs> so I'm doing quite busy. The cultivating the stance foundation is cultivating the talent is the, the main mission. So the talent, I like to do more and more contribution to the society. The only way is to develop the talent. That's much easier for me. And then, I am in 2011, I start to promote the new Wang Dao philosophy. Is we even have a Wang Dao management program, start with train the global leader, Chinese leader in China and the Taiwan. And uh, we are continuing to do this from the top to right now to become more uh, small, medium size of the company leader. And uh, of course, pro uh, the globalization of the new Wang Dao and also make popular is my mission in the long run. So right now, I'm trying to also work for the interdiscipline of the uh, across the industry of the create the value, I call this is new spinal curve, to deliver a new value for Taiwan to enhance of the uh, Taiwan companies. So I work hard for the AI medical and also the culture and the technology, and we call it MB culture, to integrate those two sides. I, in recently, in 2016, I talking about oriental civilization. Civilization means uh, change the C to the S. It's the silicon civilization because every the new civilization all based on the on the technology. I work very hard on that because I am also a opportunity to become a chairman of the National Culture and the Art Foundation. So I believe this I, is my responsibility and also I can uh, contribute a lot for the Taiwan, contribute to the global society in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. I think 10 minutes for Stan to speak his whole life is too short. <laughs> but thanks for Stan to introduce today's topics. I think talent is important. So uh, for uh, Jose, like, uh, Stan's life, he always ca take care about the human. The, even leadership is also about human. So I think today uh, talent shortage is... Uh, Serious issues. I think the uh, Stan Pan, Pan Siliang Xianshen understand that a lot. <laughs> and uh, yesterday, I just learned from our uh, three uh, distinguished panelists. One is uh, Chairman of Temasek, uh, Chairman Lin, Lin Wenxing, Dong Shizhang, and uh, also the Lynette Wu, 
uh, Wu Xin, uh, Wu Shixing from TSMC, also uh, Stan Moore, uh, uh, um, Vice uh, Provost from the uh, University of Virginia. And I learned that it's not only a Taiwan issue, it's also a common issue. So today, so uh, I will you know, save the time. So my question is about how to upgrade the supply, uh, talent supply chains. So maybe we start from the uh, Chairman Ling. Well, first, uh, I think there is uh, generally an education deficit around the world. And that deficit uh, is a deficit in funding. I think that most governments uh, underspend on education. And I would urge that uh, all governments devote more money from their limited resources to education. Because education is an investment. An investment yield us returns. Spending on other things, including defense, is expenditure. So we should be focusing more on investment. And in the education uh, sector, I think we have to look at the whole spectrum from young to old. So for the young, we have to recognize that different children learn differently. Uh, many education systems uh, in various countries are actually based on an old model where we try to teach uh, all the children the same fundamentals, with, we say, but we put them through the same system. But now we know that children learn differently. Not everybody is suited for the academic stream. Others learn better by other means, whether it's vocational training or by doing. Right? So, so I think uh, we have to re-examine the way in which we train our young. And when we do so, we have to bear in mind that we are preparing our children for a world for which we don't know what jobs they will actually do. So, therefore, the greatest lesson we can teach to the young is the need for lifelong learning. And I think that all of us who observe children know that they are by nature curious. So we should always foster that curiosity in our children. I think too often, both in terms of the education systems that we have and parents, we push our children into a very narrow path towards education and we stifle their curiosity. And if we talk about innovation in business, when you have lost your curiosity, you cannot innovate. So, so I think that's the, the key thing that we need to do for our children. Then we must not forget that after schooling, they go to work and the jobs change. Uh, if a person goes to work uh, in the early 20s, in the early 20s, they can work all the way until their 70s and even beyond. What they have learned is inadequate for that journey. And therefore, we also have to have funding for the continuing education of those in employment. Now, this is a difficult subject to discuss because it means more money and most governments don't have money and therefore are unable to provide for that. Well, in Singapore, we are a little bit more fortunate with uh, wiser uh, stewards uh, before us and we, we do have money. But even we are still only at the start of developing a continuing education system. And we have to deal with the subject of funding. And I will share with you that uh, years ago, uh, 
I was asked to lead the task force on continuing education. And uh, we came up with a report, but the key recommendation that we made shocked the cabinet and therefore did not see the light of day. And what we recommended was whatever the government spends on the education of the young, whatever that amount, be prepared to spend half that same amount a year for continuing education and training if you want the workforce to have skills that are relevant to the needs of the day. So it is a learning lesson and uh, the, the Singapore government now recognizes that they're not spending half the amount spent on the young, but uh, they're spending a lot more money than they originally anticipated. So, so I think uh, we have to, to deal, deal with that. And we have to deal with also the issue of how people in employment look at retraining. How employers in themselves look at training and what are the solutions possible. And then when you get to the, even the older age, like people who are in the late 50s, 60s, and, and early 70s, then again, the methods of teaching also have to change to suit people of that age. So I give you that uh, spectrum of the problems of, uh, of uh, the skills that we need uh, for all that we need in the various sectors in this world. Thanks for uh, Chairman Lin. I think he mentioned that the enough increased investment, increased the funding on education, also continuous education. So maybe, uh, Stephen, you, I, I guess you agree with that the funding is not always enough for the public university in the US, right? Uh, yes, that's uh, <laughs> exactly right, uh, uh, Li Shan. It, it used to be that when you went to college, back uh, in when dinosaurs roamed the earth when I did, uh, you went to college for those four years, and then you went out into the world to pursue your career and try your chances and learn to the extent that you could as you went through a normal career. And back then, most people went into one career for their whole lives. Today, that's radically different. Uh, in America, most people can count on having six, seven, even eight different career changes during the course of their working lives, and their working lives last a lot longer uh, beyond uh, the, uh, the 60 years that, uh, that Mr. Shi uh, 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 stopped. And so the concept of lifelong learning, as the chairman mentioned, has become a, a very operative principle in American education, higher education today. And you have to approach it from before the student goes to, to university, during the time that the student spends at university, and then afterward for the rest of, uh, of their lives. Uh, before, it's very important uh, when universities are recruiting students, not every person should or will go, go to college, and that's entirely natural and, and as it should be. But for those who have the potential uh, to get a college education, it's really incumbent upon universities to cast the net as widely as they can to recruit the most diverse possible pool of students and of talent to bring them into the pipeline at the very beginning. You can't just concentrate on who goes to the best schools, uh, who has the richest parents. Uh, you really need to work hard to go out into the broader society to find those students who have the most potential to develop and grow to be contributing members of the economy. This has an additional benefit uh, along the lines of uh, the, the problems that we face of, of income disparity throughout the developed world, which has a direct uh, impact on the growth of, of populism, the growth of disinformation and misinformation that the Prime Minister uh, mentioned uh, earlier this morning. So it's another benefit for making sure the input into higher education is as diverse as possible. Now, say you do that and you have the students there uh, with you, what are the principles that uh, you need to follow in making sure that you're developing that talent pool? 
Certainly the core principle, first and foremost, is you have to teach the students the current state of knowledge in the field of their, of their choosing to, to help them get fully conversant in the trends, the facts, the data associated with that. But that's not alone enough anymore. You need to, co you need to uh, connect that to other key, uh, key principles. Uh, I, I, I can think of just six. Uh, one, you have to put that discipline into a multidisciplinary context. As E.K. and Mimi mentioned on the previous panel, if you want to be a doctor, it's not just enough to learn biology and chemistry. You have to learn about the environment. You have to learn about sociology. You have to learn about communications. Uh, you have to learn about how societies interact with one another and how you get people to take the drugs that they're, uh, that they're prescribed. So you need to put uh, your knowledge into the context of a broader multidisciplinary setting. What are the other disciplines? You won't be an expert in them, but you need to at least be aware of them. Secondly, and I think this is where uh, the American education system prides itself the most on, and I think justifiably so, you need to teach critical thinking, uh, how to develop imagination, how to, de how to develop the skill to anticipate things that you never saw coming, uh, how to use, figure out to ask the hard questions about what you don't know as well as what, uh, what you do know. Uh, next, uh, it's important to have a close connection to the world of practice. This may be anathema uh, among people. I'm not a, a professional educator by, by any means. I used to work as a diplomat. But uh, knowledge, it's good to be smart. It's good to have knowledge. Uh, but it's never really an end in itself. If you're developing a higher education system that works, you must connect it to the world of practice to make sure that students know what to do with this knowledge that they're acquiring and to apply it in a way that advances the economy, advances the society in which, uh, in which they, 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 they live. Uh, next, and here as a state institution, a state university, the University of Virginia, we have it lucky. There needs to be some formal link between the world of business and other players in the economy and the world of government. Uh, yesterday we talked about the importance of public-private partnerships. I think this is one of the most important areas uh, to, to have that kind of public partner, uh, private public partnership. Uh, in Virginia, for example, we have something called the Virginia uh, Economic Development Partnership that is a gathering place for business, for the higher education community to identify what are the emerging needs in the economy and it operates in a very quickly uh, emerging, uh, emer emerging way. Uh, there needs to be global engagement. There's a lot of talk about decoupling, de-risking. Uh, um, yes, that's, that's probably going to happen, but globalization is not over. Uh, uh, Maria, what you invented at Davos is here to stay, whether people and policymakers like it or, uh, or not. So we have a job to make sure our students are able to engage with the rest of the world. They're able to operate in a different culture, speak a different language. And so it's a very important requirement for higher education to make sure our students have that global engagement. Uh, there needs to finally, at the end, when students are leaving, you need to teach them the, the skills of how they're going to acquire new knowledge as they go on for the next 50 years of their, their lives. And that's the most important goodbye gift any university can give when it hands out the diplomas at the, uh, at the end. Now, that's at the end, so what happens, uh, what happens after uh, all of that? So here is where lifelong learning really begins to, uh, to kick, into, uh, kick into gear. The uh, Christopher, there, there's a, a great book that came out a couple of years ago called The 60-Year Curriculum, written by uh, Christopher Deed and John Richards, who laid out a number of different models of how we can ensure our students keep up with rapidly changing technology uh, to stay abreast of all of these developments. Um, and, Every university, if it doesn't have already, should have a continuing education school that links up to each of the primary schools of a university to make sure that there's a strategy to continue to convey new knowledge, uh, new insights to students long after they lead. Uh, alumni engagement is also very important. Uh, so, for example, next week, 
uh, when I get back to Virginia. Uh, we have a big uh, alumni reunion uh, uh, that uh, happens every summer, and there's a whole syllabus of, uh, of, of courses that happens uh, during that. I'm going to have to give a lecture on updates on what's happening on foreign policy issues, and there'll be somebody from the engineering school to talk about that, somebody from our data science school to do that. So that's uh, obviously very informal and, and, uh, and, and not very systematic, but it's an important part uh, of, uh, of, of doing it. Uh, the, it's important to bring educational facilities close to the workplace. Uh, so either through online engagement, which we're in the process of developing as many other universities are, uh, or to bring actual campuses to where there are people working. So for example, at the University of Virginia, we're about two hours away from Washington, D.C. We're opening a campus uh, right in Washington, D.C., uh, where people can go over the weekends, in the evenings, to continue to develop their, uh, their, 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 their knowledge. So I think as long as you concentrate on the before, beginning, and after, that will lay the foundation for good lifetime learning. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. I think you already provide the solution to the question you found. But uh, maybe Lynette, I think you, when you listen to the, uh, Stephen, he mentioned about uh, cooperation uh, across the nation, across the countries. So first of all, I will want to introduce, I think you have a very special title. You, I know you just relocated to Taiwan um, uh, in the fourth quarter last year. So maybe you can introduce your job title. It's quite interesting for me. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. First and foremost, I'm Lynette. I'm now the elite HR strategic planning and transformation for TSMC, trying to bring a new equation to how we look at human capital for the betterment of the semicon industry and our humble company. I've been a beneficiary of the Singaporean system. I relocated from Singapore to Taipei, uh, to Sinchu specifically, in September last year. So it's been a wonderful eight, nine months in this part of the world, and to be able to be part of this dialogue has been a particular privilege. Actually, Ned just arrived uh, yesterday night. Yes. Uh, from I came back from Arizona after spending a week there. It's my third trip in, in the last two months. Um, it's been exciting to be part of the, our aspirations overseas and watching our project come to life before my eyes and watching the commitment and the call of duty of my comrades has been particularly inspiring. So what's the top three question, top three issues for the global talent supply chain in your mind? So first and foremost, I think as an HR practitioner for the last 30 years, I've made peace with um, the state of union with talent. You know, that's a byproduct of birth rates, that's a byproduct of many other uh, contributing factors, but the state of the union is what we have. Instead, I, liked, uh, I think there's tremendous mileage if we started looking at talent pipelining, where do we want them to be, how do we play to their strength, and about talent bench strength. Where do we add muscles, when do we add muscles, and how do we add muscles? I think that's the state of play that my colleagues and I are focusing our energies on in terms of building uh, the talent capital for the semicon industry. So I think that's the top of my issue. The second is to build muscles beyond the functional brilliance and the academic brilliance that the semicon industry has been a beneficiary of. We have been um, successful as a company, as an industry. We have seen tremendous transforming, transformational impact to humankind thanks to a very talented workforce. The question is, what's next? Not so much of what do we have right now. And I think what's next has to be about navigating borders, where we break down borders, where we break down cultural differences, where we have a skillful, deft application of what we are able to have learned in school in continuous education. But really taking that into and beyond the boundaries of cultures, norms, geography, and the velocity of changes that's hitting us in the world. It's about building the capital in each of them to know how to make decisions swiftly, to be able to draw abroad upon a broader frame of reference, to be able to tap upon global perspectives but local intelligence, and to be able to thrive and make peace with the changes that they are here to stay and not hang on too tightly to the successes that has taken us here. 
I think that's a very famous book whom I'm a big fervent supporter of. What got us here may not get us there. So the ability to navigate that, I think, is that skill that industries like where I'm privileged to work with and academic associations and uh, statutory uh, bodies can really collaborate and build a new equation to what the future can look like. I have a following up question. Uh, you mentioned that it's very important to uh, uh, expand, uh, expand the, the uh, Taiwan talent's potential, uh, you know, uh, expand uh, uh, beyond the borders. So what's your observation about Taiwan talent right now? Oh, we, have a big tal we have a big problem with Taiwan talent. They're just too talented to start with. <laughs> They're too clever. They work too hard. They, they play too little, they sleep too little, all of the above. It's been a privilege watching them in action whenever I travel abroad to my overseas affiliates. So when I look at a problem and I say, okay, how do I solve this good problem we have? I think that's a starting point. Um, there's been a lot of learnings. Like I say, I've benefited from a, a, a very open and encouraging education system that draws upon references beyond um, my humble little country. But we have progressed because we were able to leverage on a lot of learnings from extremely talented and accomplished companies, colleagues, associates, associates worldwide. So I think I'll summarize that to say the ability to reference uh, to draw upon a broad a broader reference is a starting point the second is really to what chairman lim has said that sense of curiosity to really keep nurturing and giving oxygen to that sense of curiosity and not be too bound by one's successes within one's function or one's country or one's company but really to break all of that away i think that's the second the third is to be really um, earnest, really diligent in tapping on continuous education. And I'd like to stretch that a little bit. Continuous education may not just mean online learning, offline learning. It means really get, throwing ourselves at immersion into doing something different, that immersion of participating in cross-pollination projects, that immersion of applying our best and paying it forward in a different country, in a different arena. Because that exchange itself is so um, educational, is so enriching. And when giving, in, I think in Chinese we say, si bi shou geng you fu. So as we give, we learn. So that giving in an enterprise perspective involves participation in different projects, in the curiosity and the openness to be willing to share and to be challenged and to learn that there's something else we didn't know before. And there's another way of delivering success together. I think that sense of collaboration would really change what um, the future could look like. So it's about going from good to great and constantly staying in that humility and that curiosity. In our uh, private discussion, I think Lynette <laughs> actually mentioned one interesting point. He, uh, she told me that uh, when the talent become very specific on one profession, it's hard to expand that. So according to your profession, when is the best timing for the Taiwan talent to become like more international and more willing to take the broader uh, challenges? I like to engage talent and I think first of all, we have to break down the concept of early or late away from biological age. I think that that's important because we come with a lot of um, kudos. All of, of the, all of the colleagues I've, I've interacted with come with a lot of kudos in their functional depth. You know, they could be a technologist for a long time, but they're relatively young as I transfer them over to work in human resources, for example. So I think we need to first break away that biological thing as partially you know, to help myself get a little bit, <laughs> get away from this a little bit. Um, so. By notion of early, I think it's early in terms of contribution and impact, if we first keep to that frame of reference. I like to throw them out there earlier to be able to, as, as they embark on trying to discover. So early in discovery, I think that's what I'm looking for. 
early in discovery of a new discipline, early in discovery of a new geography, early in the discovery of a new um, league, a new modus operandi. I think that's important. And by early, we also need to be holistic. You don't want to just throw them into one dimensional of learning. We want to be able to really stretch their minds and say, not only are you learning the what in the new function, in a new country, but you're also navigating and building muscles in the how you do it. So a constant navigation between the what and the how would really keep them, um, to help them first unlearn the muscle memory they have, and then learn new muscle memories and build that practice. So we've got to start it early. If they are starting, for example, if, as they're finishing college, I, I would, we are working on an initiative where we start blending industrial practice with college. Now, there's nothing new in that. You know, that's been as long as, as conventional wisdom has for us. But the magic, the alchemy lies in the how. How do we do that? How do we get the different collaborators all to be in that mode of curiosity and learning? So we teach our, we, we help our managers learn how to manage uh, new colleagues coming in differently. We help the new associates from the, from the schools, the new students from the school joining our ecosystem to learn differently. So I think that's where the alchemy is. Thanks, Linnet. Uh, I think the next round we are discussing about the role of the company in the future uh, talent supply chain. So I know that Temaxic actually uh, invents a lot of companies and uh, uh, the chairman actually initiated a very interesting conversation called Temasek, a three-party conversation between the invest investor, Temasek, and uh, the company they invest, and also the working force. I'm quite curious about this conversation. What's the result? And uh, do you think that the company should play more uh, important roles to improve oh. this kind of uh, working environment? If you don't mind, it will take a little longer in replying to your question. Uh, in Singapore, we thought that employers had a role in continuing education and training. So what we did was to impose a payroll tax of 2%. And then tell the employers that uh, when you embark on training of your, your employees, you can claim from the skills development fund. It is, it's actually a commingle fund, so it, you contribute so much, you can actually draw out more if you are creative. And I know some companies actually did that. So, so that was uh, to encourage the companies to retrain. However, not all companies retrain. And I say so because not all companies are forward-looking. And not all companies know where they want to go to. Not all companies know what the skill sets are required. And therefore, that scheme worked only for the forward-looking advanced companies. Right? Now, how do we get companies to be involved in training? Some companies actually get involved in training by necessity. But I think we should uh, make a necessity a virtue. So in the shifting supply chains, uh, companies will move to less developed countries and start out uh, new uh, factories. But you don't have the workers with the skill sets required for those factories. So what do they do? They set up their own training colleges. So if I take the example of Vietnam. Samsung has their own college. And I believe it is to train the people for themselves, plus extra for the industry, if so, so be it. Vietnamese company, Vin Group, has set up their own university. I think also for the same purpose. They're going into different things, including uh, electric vehicles. So obviously requiring uh, Vietnamese workers uh, with the uh, skill sets for these new industries. So there is a role for companies, and large companies actually have embarked on it. And I think that uh, if we uh, push this further, that more can be done in all countries uh, with uh, the private-public uh, uh, partnerships. 
So that's, uh, I think, a, a very uh, good example of uh, what can be done in, and it is in Vietnam. And if I stay with Vietnam, uh, the Vietnamese government wanted to develop the IT industry. So they set a goal of training one million talent. And they have been successful in training IT talent. So I was recently curious as to how it was done. I did a bit of work on my smartphone to try to find out uh, which uh, ministry and uh, how they did it. I came to a website on the government website that mentioned it. They trained 650,000. It's a short period of time, 650,000. So if you want to move the needle, as uh, Stencher says, set bold targets, and it can be done. So, right? 650,000. Then you figure out how to do it. And I was very curious how they did it. In the same website, it says, in partnership with the private sector. And then the, I was curious who in the private sector. Because that website didn't tell me. And I did a bit more work. I found that Google was involved. Subsequently, I had the discussions with some Vietnamese uh, friends and found that another company called FPT in Vietnam was also involved. So it is a private-public sector partnership for a national program of quickly training the skill sets needed for industries that were coming into Vietnam. Now, if I uh, uh, then move on to your, your specific question about what we're doing in Singapore, uh, apart from the Skills Development Fund, but is that we have a portfolio we have portfolio companies, and we know that there are certain trends and changes uh, in industry, and this will affect our portfolio companies. And so therefore, they too should be alive to it on the why, the what, and the how. So we have been conducting what we call the Tamasic Tripartite Conversations uh, with uh, the companies in our portfolio, the management, the union representatives, and the government agencies involved. <clears throat> and we discussed uh, the change that might happen in the sector. So last year, it was on climate change, on sustainability, and how that's going to affect the companies, uh, in, in this particular instance, in the mobility, the transport, uh, and the uh, built environment sectors. Right? So, so it was a necessary conversation to bring everybody at least to a common uh, basis to discuss the subject. Right? So you must have some knowledge. So we got a consultant to, you know, to, to tell everybody about that. Different people are at different stages. So bring everybody the same uh, reference line. And then the, to understand what it means for the business of that company, and therefore which areas they should be start to start looking at. And then to understand how the jobs are going to change. How the existing employees are going to have to relearn, adapt, to the new things which the company may be doing. Right? So, so this builds uh, a common understanding and therefore facilitates the collaboration within the enterprise. Uh, that, uh, that was last year. We are going to do a follow-up uh, in September this year on with the same companies on what are the things to do. And, what are the, and this year, we are bringing a, a different set of uh, uh, people together to discuss artificial intelligence and the impact of artificial intelligence on business and what it means to jobs. If they doing nothing, what's their punishment? <laughs> we are encouraging. I, th I think that uh, when, the when everybody understands what is changing, 
the management knows that if they do nothing, the business is going to uh, decline. And therefore, it's in the interest of the company to do something. As far as the employees are concerned, I think employees worldwide, as far as I know, because my, I've spent many years in the trade unions, working for the trade unions, uh, every worker wants some assurance that I can do a job, I can earn an income that will feed my family. If you address that fundamental aspiration of the worker, I believe that all workers will be cooperative. Germany actually is a very, very strong background working uh, in the trade union, right? So I think you believe the workers' power. <laughs> yes, power, but uh, not, not power as is exercised in many countries. Because in many countries, the exercise of union power is broad power. Because they don't understand what's going on, they don't know what to do, and the only thing they know is to resist and to fight and to stop things from changing. We take the approach that we have to educate union leaders and workers about change and what they can do, give them the confidence that they can change, they can adapt, and therefore, actually, life can be better because they'll be, be doing a better job earning a better pay. It's, it is work that has to be done all the time, but unfortunately, it's not done in most countries. We have two minutes left, so my question for Lynette and uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, I think I'm curious about, uh, from your perspective, what's the most eff effective way for the company to participate with the university, and what's the best way to co-work with the university? Maybe one minute for each. <laughs> Uh, well, speaking from a, a university perspective, what's increasingly popular in the United States, certainly uh, with us at the University of Virginia, is creating spaces for business and academia to interact um, immediately in real, real time. So, for example, uh, we've just decided to create an institute for biotechnology uh, with a substantial contribution from our state government. Uh, a private um, philanthropist uh, uh, donated $100 million, and uh, business is also donating money. And this biotech institute uh, will provide a venue for our scientists and researchers to work side by side. They'll be co-located with an incubator of startup uh, uh, biotech uh, companies. And so that will provide a nexus for cutting-edge research to be shared with cutting-edge uh, business. We're just at the beginning of starting it, but I think it's a really uh, exciting model for, for promoting that close cooperation. How about Inet? Well, from the perspective of an enterprise, I think it comes from two main things. First is to um, be very generous in offering what uh, we have to offer to the academics. And TSMC does that. We have academic and research collaborations where we share perspectives and information about our technology to advance the learning and the design. Secondly is to be shameless in asking for what we want the future to look like. To think together what, is, what are the future capabilities that we'll like, we imagine that are required in the future, and co-creating that, building that curriculum, and building those muscles together with the colleges, the universities, earlier in the system, and providing the bridge for the students to be able to access the real life, when rubber hits the road, what does it look like, that kind of world, to the students way earlier in their careers. So the idea is not only to nurture, but to inspire and to provide them with a flavor of what the reality is like. And hopefully that gains traction and that builds not only the muscles, but that passion in them way earlier. On that note, thank you for having me. Time is up. So I uh, hope you enjoyed today's conversation. So let's uh, thank three uh, distinguished panelists again.